Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. Sunday, October 17, 2021. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Cubs All About the Bear Podcast with the Sherman Lake, episode number 621. This time I got it right on the second time because, again, my software fucked up and had to change things, and I didn't check it. So, oh well. In any case, we got Edward Angelina Cook with us, which is always great. Yay! Yay! Demon is out sick, sadly. But it's that time again for another landscape of relationships. And what are we talking about today? Well, um, we're talking about uh, building your or creating your party. So this is where we uh, go to a tower and post a message on the board saying we got a thing that needs to be taken care of. And then we get a bunch of adventurers popping up. We have to make sure we got somebody who's good at like a frontline sort of person. We got the healer. We got, uh, and then a couple of people to just like to punch things. Or cast spells. Kind of. Yeah. Um, so... The other, so I guess it was, what was it, like, two weeks ago? Um, we were, like, I was trying to come up with an idea for for this month, and I uh, decided to message Gary, and I was like, hey, do you think it would be a good idea to ask the entourage, you know, what topics they would like to hear about, um, you know, because... I would like to, you know, maybe get some fresh ideas, go in directions that I may not be going, right? So uh, so we did, and I feel like that was really helpful. Um, and two comments uh, specifically, uh, you know, kind of helped point me in this direction. Uh, one was from Charlie, and the other one was Tommy. And um, Charlie was talking about, uh, you know, uh, like parental or like in-law relationships and when lines were crossed. Um, and Tommy was talking about like ending relationships, like long-term relationships. And, you know, that got me thinking and I was on Facebook as one does. And, uh, and I came across this uh, page that I had never seen before called the superpower toolkit. Uh, and it's a nerd or geek therapy uh, Facebook page. Um, and you know, my therapy is basically geek and nerd therapy. And it was a image of, um, a, uh, kind of like a person in the middle with spokes leaning out from it. Um, and it said, create your party. And around it were, um, you know, things like, um, you know, like, so don't go alone, build your party. So, you know, have your therapist, your doctor, um, have religion there, friends, uh, community, coworkers, partner, and family. And I was like, oh my goodness, what a great, uh, what a great image and what a great segue into, uh, to those, those comments. Um, and it got me thinking about how Dungeons and Dragons uh, is a really wonderful analogy um, for social relationships uh, in therapy and in real life. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today um, is 
how it's really important for us to make sure that we have what we need um, and who we need in our lives that is going to get us where we eventually want to go um, on this adventure called life. And that is not going to get us killed by the ogre. Or some other. What, what exactly is the ogre? It could be um, many things, I know, suppose. Like, yeah, it could be a lot of things. Okay. And killed as in, you know, not actually killed, but, you know, we don't kind of get where we want to go or, you know, we have a total, total fail or whatever. Okay. I just, given the analogy, I thought you had something in mind specifically. No, not, yeah, no, I think the ogre can be, you know, anything, you know, like, um, um, you know, sometimes it could be work. Sometimes it could be, um, you know, a health crisis. Sometimes it can be, um, you know, just a really bad day. Um, you know, the ogre can be a lot of things. So most likely the ogre is a life challenge of some yeah. kind. Could be mental health, could be physical, could be spiritual, something along those lines. Yeah, any yeah. any kind of stress that is that is uh, uh, that we face. Some sort of hurdle. Uh, in D&D terms, for those people who are D&D, each of these different ogres have different talent ratings. Some are just a half. Well, some are like a 13 and are really, really big and powerful. Some are big problems, some are little problems. Yeah, so, um, so Jeff, for like, for those of us who may not be, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or tabletop role playing game aficionados, um, can you... Tell us what a party is. So a party of adventurers are those who who are somehow on, uh, meet each other, whether it's by a tavern or uh, they were just hired on to escort a caravan, and then they come to some events, and they end up working together to defeat enemies, to uh, solve mysteries. Um, and it could... And it can have a variety of people. In D&D, they really the matter, but usually people try to optimize with like somebody who takes the brunt force of, uh, of everything, the tank, the one who's just in the face of the enemy. Well, you have the healer who makes sure keep, tries to keep everybody alive. You have all the DPS, those who are trying to beat down the, the, down the opponent. And they work together to not just defeat enemies, but also have social interactions as well. Uh, maybe they're just trying to get some information at a party um, and they have to somehow get in the door and and interact with the, the people. People and uh, some of the ones that are more charismatic will probably do most of the talking while the others kind of sit back and brood or, or even just look intimidating in order to get more information from somebody. But each of them has their own special talent. And they are used in different ways. So one just likes smacking things with a hammer. Well, another one, people. And maybe be able to convince somebody to do something or not even fight. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's really, so what I'm hearing is a lot of it is a lot of kind of knowing, knowing the roles that people play. Mm-hmm. And each person in your party has a different role or specialization that they can help the the team as a whole. It's a team thing. Right, exactly, right. And um, would it make sense for uh, for somebody to look at a healer and get upset that they weren't able to be the brute strength person? 
Depends on the party, but sure. Be like... You know what I mean? Well, we couldn't defeat them because you weren't attacking them at all. I was trying to keep you alive! Exactly right. So, like... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm laughing because I'm like, hey, it, it's a little dramatic because I'm like, that sounds like a dysfunctional party. If they're like, if that kind of like drama Those are the best. is taking place. The point is, is that like there's expectations of what key people are going to be doing. And if some people are expecting something different from an individual in the party, that could be a misalignment and it will cause confusion or, or issues. I think it's more about everybody understanding what their role is and, and recognizing those strengths. That's what would make sense to me. Yeah, and I think I think we've kind of talked about it before. One of my things that I talk about with my with my clients often is don't go to the hardware store for bread. Um, so like, don't go um, like if you know that, say one of your friends is not that supportive person, right? Um, don't go to them asking for support when they're not. That's not the role that they provide for you right um or um i mean that's uh you know i mean that that's a good example right mm, i think so um it is i'm i'm trying not to be a fly in the ointment because i'm like thinking of possibilities where the analogy is valid but also not quite correct but anyways what do you mean well, if you live in a very small town and you have a mom and pop like all, catch all store, you might think of it as the hardware store when in fact it's a little bit of everything. So you might very well be able to find bread there. Um, but that's not perhaps it's like function. And that's why I was like, I realized I was kind of being a jerk about it. Um, and it wasn't my intent. I was just thinking I'm like, having visited small towns, you walk into a little store and you're like, wow. There's a little yeah. bit of everything in here, like from mm -hmm. really old items that perhaps shouldn't be there anymore, um, you know, to, uh, you know, just this and that and bric a brac. And you're kind of like, wow, you have a vintage like collection of magazines from 1978, <laughs> you know, like. You know, but I think that speaks more to just the culture of that. And going with what I'm saying, this perhaps isn't the location you should be going to that. Only because if you're looking for something specific, you should be seeking out the appropriate place to get that, whatever that is. So in the case of creating the party, if you're looking for someone to be the listener to, you know, kind of either vent to or to bounce ideas off of then hopefully you're going to that type of an individual as opposed to a people pleaser or a problem solver like because those roles also can exist but perhaps those aren't the things that you want in that moment i'm i'm kind of a problem solver not kind of i am so <laughs> i've had to tell like my closest friends especially some people come and talk to me about something and i have to sort of remind them after it had been initially said to me, you know, I don't need I don't need you to help me figure out a way to overcome this or whatever. I just need you to be here. And then I was mm -hmm. like, oh, so I kind of learned since then to say to some people, hold up, do you need me to listen or do you want me to help? Because if you want me to help, then I'm going to try to figure out how to solve your problem or give you some solutions or considerations some options. If you just want me to listen, that's cool. But you have to tell me that because if you don't, I'm going to default to my thing. And so I need you to, like, help me be what you need me to be in that moment. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're going to the hardware store, uh, but they, they, they're going to Ace Hardware in order to get bread. And the problem is, is... The bread's in another store. Yeah. Um, or like, you know, in a D and D analogy, I know that uh Jeff when we played, you know, um if we didn't have a healer, right? Um, I was gonna have to wait until we got back to the tavern or wherever in order to get, you know, 
healed or whatever. Um, so I couldn't, you know, look to somebody in my party who didn't have healing capabilities and ask them, can you please heal me? And then they look at me like, no. <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I, I don't have any potions on me. Or, uh, 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 I, I don't know how to cast spells. I'm a fighter. I, didn't, I wasn't, I'm not a cleric or anything. Exactly. So, like, um, so yeah, so I think it's, it, it is important to kind of know the roles of everybody in your, in your party, right? And, um, and to evaluate it. Like, is this working for me? Do I have everything that I need? Who's missing? What's missing? How do you determine that if you don't know? Like, if you ha don't have a pre kind of set, like, oh, I should be having these five or six things. How do you figure out what you're missing, I guess? I mean, that's a, that, that is a good question. Um, and I think that is a uh, that is a question for self reflection. But I think it's a what you know. What are the things that you keep getting frustrated with? You know, um, like what what walls do you keep running into? Um, you know, how much? And you know, sometimes I'll say, what is the what is the common denominator there? You are. Um, so, like, what what is it that you feel like you're missing? Are you missing? Um, are you missing somebody to hear you? Are you missing somebody to meet your needs? Um, you know, uh, if you know they were talking about family, right? Um, if you're not getting the support that you need from your family, well, maybe we need to start creating a family. So this sounds to me more like about how we in the LGBTQ plus community have a times reference to like chosen family, which is a counterpoint to like blood family. So I have the family that I'm blood related to through my mother and my father, but I also have the family that I have brought together over the decades of my adult life, basically. And that's people that I've met in various circumstances different points and most likely i consider them close confidants people i know quite a bit about um you know that when we get together we don't really have to do anything to relate to each other because we've built these bonds over time yeah and um before we get there i also wanted to just kind of layer on another concept um so something else that i am rather familiar with is a, a sociologist term or sociology term called social capital, um, which is very similar to what we're talking about here. Um, and there are two, uh, well, one's a sociologist and the other one's a political scientist. Um, so Pierre Bourdieu, Bourdieu um, is um, a French sociologist. And so he defines um, social capital as the the sum of our resources, actual or virtual, that accrue to an individual or a group by virtue of possessing a durable network of more or less institutionalized relationships of mutual uh, acquaintance and recognition. Um, and I think that is important, right, because of the actual or virtual. Uh, you know, in today's day and age, um, we have actual relationships and actual resources, but we also have virtual resources, whether that is through the Internet, whether that is through. Um, well, pretty much <laughs> the, the Internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, these 
you know, well, so th the other thing that I um, that I talk about when um, I give my story is the fact that I came out at a very weird time um, in between the uh, kind of like the uh, the tail end of the uh, the larger um, or the 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 bigger end of the the AIDS epidemic, right? Um, like the late nineties. And right before the the digital queer communities, right? Like the um, like the apps that we have now. Um, so, which is a very weird liminal space. Um, so you know, it's it's you know that's like kind of like the actual and then the virtual. Um, so I have experience with kind of both of those because you know there are people in my life that I've never met in person ever. Um, and I'm probably never going to meet them. Are they still connections to me? Yes. And they're still resources to me. Um, it doesn't mean that they are any more or any less. Um, so these are the bonds that we create. Um, then we have another, uh, political scientist. His name is Robert Putman. Uh, he wrote this awesome book on the decline of American society as seen through um, uh, bowling communities. Um, there's a, a book called Bowling Alone. So he defined uh, social capital as connections among individuals, social networks, and the norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness that arise from them. Um, and that kind of talks about kind of the, um, you know, like the, uh, well, the norm. So it, that talks about the norms um, where the other one doesn't. Um, and I think in our, in, in the LGBT community, um, the queer community, right? Like there are, um, you know, there, and you know, we have those social networks, um, even within the bear community, um, which is all, which is really, really interesting. I had never really thought before about this concept of digital queer communities. And I guess it's because of like, like you were talking about at like the time frame in which I came out, like, my initial queer communities were live and in person. However, later at the very end of the 90s, coming into the new millennium, I did end up like having more understanding that there was, you know, this online connection kind of aspect of things. What I find interesting about that is that we, well, I think for us specifically as an age group, like we adapted to that relatively easy and found a community without having to physically be together in some ways. So I think about like when I was in, so when I was in college, I came out in my freshman year and then I say I like, I spent seven years, I was out and then I had another coming out in 99 cool. when I learned about the bear community because I found my tribe. Like I thought I found my tribe uh, when in really, in reality, I kind of found like the broader grouping. And then within that, I found a tribe. So, um, and that's one of the interesting things about what you're talking about is this concept of um, connecting with people and whether it's, you know, virtual or actual, virtual or real, um, it gives you some grounding, like the ability to, probably feel more comfortable um, and not so much maybe confused or lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like I know as far as the, the bear community, um, like my relationship to the bear community was completely virtual um, mostly until I was with Jim. Uh, Jim brought me to my first bear run, which was drenched fur. Um, he brought me to my first uh, camping uh, experience, which was a bear experience. Um, so I've never known a bear community 
uh, until nine years ago. It was all very virtual and on um, apps. Hmm. I've heard I heard of those events, but I never I I never I never went to them. Was there anything in particular that you decided at the time not to engage with, like going to events? Uh, I did not feel um, welcome. Like I was welcome. Like I think that I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel comfortable. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was fine observing, but I I didn't think that I would be. Um, I don't think that like so actual or virtual, right? I don't think that the actual um, community. I think that would that would have been too overwhelming for me. Which is interesting, considering that you know me and I'm insanely extroverted. It kind of sounds mm. like me, like way back in the day, because living in Minnesota, uh, the what were they called? There was a bear group in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they had on Wednesdays they had a this like two miter event thing where they would have bear coffee, where they would all meet at a coffee house, and then after that we would have dinner. And go to an Applebee's, one in Minneapolis, one in St. Paul, and sometimes pe different people between the two. Sometimes some of the people crossed over, etc. And I used to religiously go up to drive an hour and a half up up to uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul to go and hang out with them. I felt very extroverted for the longest time. I think. After I moved down here and probably a few years after I moved down here, I think I went from this like stage of being really extroverted to being a mad, mad introvert. Like if I went up to a bar by myself, um, I would need to know somebody to go if I was going that was going to be there to to do something and then eventually i just kind of got in this like social anxiety i don't know if that's the right word or anything and just things would start overwhelming me and i would just leave i would essentially basically be bored or there was too many people or something like that and now i just don't go out because i don't go out because i don't feel like it's fun and I haven't really dated or done anything with anybody for years now. And I don't know if that means that I've basically kind of cut off my social support group, social capital or anything. I do have like friends I talk to online. I have here and everything. Um, I have... Um, and I do still have like that my old roommate from back when I lived in St. Paul. Um, I still consider us good friends, but I don't really talk to him that much or anything. Kind of very much a loner. Although I have like joy, I have joined the uh, a bear gamer community on Discord, and we play D and D. Um, and some other things. So I do have some social interactions, but for the most part, I'm this last year and a half to me has been great <laughs> because I don't like going anywhere. I I can just stick at home, have my food delivered, cook for myself, that sort of thing. And it's that's the type of social support group that I really have is I don't know if it's non-existent and I think part of it could also be like I don't know what I need like there's things I know that I need there's things that I 
that I have what I need. There's things that I have that I don't really realize that I have. And then there's the things that I don't know that I should have that I need. And I think it's challenging when the life circumstances come through in our path, you know, and we experience them and it's like, okay, what do I, what do I do about this? Like I was just saying to someone recently at work, um, kind of related to what you're saying, Jeff, like I, I spent years working from home and I was okay with that. Um, I was still social kind of still went out and did things, but like it, my life became a little insular and this job that I've had now for a year and a half, year and three quarters or whatever, um, I have to go to work. And I just mentioned recently about like how we're having this issue with work about like whether or not people can work remote anyways. And I said, and someone was like, do you want to work remote? And I was like, I don't want to quote unquote. I said, but I will say this going back into a physical workplace and being around people and having to interact with them is a thing. And when you're not wanting to do that, like you don't feel they have the energy the psychological bandwidth, whatever you want to call it, it can become really challenging because there I can understand the um, the warmth and the draw of not going and dealing with people because people are stressful. People are annoying. They're like rude. They don't pay attention. They're in their own bubbles and they don't realize when they're in their office next to you and they're singing to themselves out loud that you can clearly hear them. And, you know, that like they make noise, you know, they interrupt your train of thought or whatever. So, you know, and when you're in kind of in your own home, I think you might feel more comfortable. But at the same time, being at home all the time, I realized that like I lost connection and I wasn't quite aware of that. But it wasn't until I started going and doing things. And now like I have to go out into the community and interact with individuals and I'm not thrilled about it, but at the same time, I'm not like, uh, I'm not having panic attacks. I have a small amount of anxiety, but it's not, you know, something intolerable. It's human. It's just discomfort is, is really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. So I, I think, and having, having a connection with other people about some of the experience that we've had specifically regarding the, the big, you know, traumatic event of COVID and the pandemic and what it's done for the global society plus our you know here in the u.s and and just our local geo areas i think it's it's something to you know be seen where it comes out i was just saying to a coworker recently i was like i really truly feel and i think i said this on the podcast recent recently that 2021 is kind of like the recovery year from the year that we don't talk about. And then 2022 is more the, we might begin to get back into the swing of what like normal quote unquote life is like, like people taking vacations and going places and doing things and not really feeling like we have to have a lot of caution and concern. Now I'm not saying that it's going to be this, you know, free for all and people are going to, you know, be idiots or whatever, because it's obviously happening currently anyways. Um, I just feel that, you know, we we will feel like, oh, I, I can do things like I can go to an event or take a vacation or travel, you know, without without like, yeah, there will be some modified like, uh, you know, operations to it because, you know, we still have what, like 60 some plus million, you know, people population in the U.S. that are not vaccinated. And honestly, we're at this stage now where it's like, if you're not vaccinated, you choose not to be vaccinated. That's what it comes down to. It's not a supply issue. It's not an access issue. It's a you thing. Like, and you're choosing mm -hmm. that. So now, it, now it becomes norm that everything we deal with will be because this is where we are. End of story. Like, and, and it and it becomes part of the the basis of, of where we're at. So I feel that the whole nation overall is going to be going through this process. And I think it'll be five to 10 years before we can really look back and see the impact in all the areas that are going on. Like right now there's this whole, you know, issue that we can't get supplies for things and that we have backlogs and there isn't an industry that hasn't been touched. Um, you know, and I, even I was surprised I went grocery shopping recently and I was like, wow, like there's whole shelves of stuff missing. 
And I was just really kind of surprised, even though I've heard in headlines and stuff about this, but I was just like, okay, that's the thing apparently. Um, so I, I think we all collectively are going through our own personal journeys of where we are and how we want to integrate with things. And I can see where people might want to be reluctant and not really be like, you know what? I'm I'm cool. I'm good. And, you know, we've we've developed all these technologies and conveniences that give us the ability to have our lives customized in a way that, that we couldn't do before. Um, my hope is, is that, you know, we as we're slowly kind of reintegrating or doing these kind of things that we that we can shift. And I think a piece of that is going to be this concept of having our group that we can, you know, meet with, do things with, we can, uh, you know, kind of rely on as we maybe kind of feel like we're stumbling through this whole um, process. And so, you know, it may very well be, you know, taking an account of our inventory of what we call this social capital, this concept we're talking about, and determining, you know, what, what, the who, what, where, when uh, of our lives. Yeah, so... Uh... So I think that I think COVID definitely um, impacted a lot of that. I know that for me, um, you know, I'm a, uh, 90 percent of my work is done at home uh, and, you know, there's the push to. So are you going to see clients back in person? And I'm like, if they don't want it, I don't want to give it, <laughs> you know, Um uh, I'm fine sitting right here. I think that I do a hell of a good enough job um, right here. Uh, and my clients are satisfied. Um, and when it is time, uh, we will go. Uh, has that impacted um, areas of my life? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some relationships in my life that aren't as close as they were. Um, but there are relationships in my life that are stronger um, because because uh, I needed to rely on um, certain people, right? I needed to uh, to reach out and um, and kind of like what Gary said, I needed to to foster those connections. Um, especially during COVID, uh, because, you know, it was really important to me and my mental health, uh, you know, as a um, provider. And I know that, you know, when we don't have that connection, um, you know, it can be a recipe for some, you know, depression, anxiety, you know, things like that. And those are just things to look out for. Um, and I think when we, when we're talking about the social capital though, um, and when when we're looking at that model, we don't have to have all those things like on there's religion. We don't, we don't need religion. Right. Um, uh, you know, but I think for me, What's really important is know which direction I'm headed, you know, um, and when I'm working, so Gary asked a question before about, um, you know, what if you don't know what you need? So one thing that I will ask people when they're like, well, I don't know what I need, or I don't know what to do, or I don't know what I want. I'll ask people, um, so like, say that we are, um, say I snap my fingers, I wave a wand, and we're a year in the future. And your life is as perfect as you could possibly want it. Describe it to me. What do you see? Who's there? What are you eating? What are you driving? Where are you working? How are you feeling? Tell me everything about that from morning, from the moment you wake up until the, the second you go to sleep. I want to know everything that happened in that one day, that perfect for you day. 
So like, how is that not where you're at right now? And why is that perfect for you? And how can we get you there? And what do you need? What do you want in order to get you there? Let's create your team. It's an interesting perspective to kind of do a comparative analysis to say, let's look at today and then let's look at X point in the future where things are 100% optimized across all fronts. And then that's how you, you determine what the difference is between the two. Yeah, let's let's shoot for the moon um, and hope we get among the stars, right? Um, and sometimes that's what I'll do for myself is, you know, at the beginning of the month, I'll say in a perfect world, what would I want to do this month or what would I want to do this year? Um, if there were no limitations, if there was no fear, what would I want to do? What would, what, what would I do? Um, and that's a really good jumping off point for me to go like, uh, three weeks ago, um, Disney, um, had their 50th, um, anniversary and I was like, and they were, uh, retiring, uh, happily ever after the, uh, the fireworks show that when I went to see that for my 40th birthday, I sobbed. Like I was a, a sobbing mess, and I just said out loud, "Oh, I would love to go see that one more time." And Jim said, "So go." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> and he was like, "Go if you can make it work, go." Um, and I was like, "That that's next week, like <laughs> how?" And he was like, "Can it work?" Um, and first I was like, who are you and where is my husband? Because that's not something that he would ever say. But then I was like, well, what what if I could do that? How would that work? And I, I like conceptualize if that was possible. And logistically, financially, it was possible. Um, but at the end of the day, I just didn't want to go through the hassle <laughs> of only going to Disney for just two days. Um, and it just, it wasn't going to be worth it. Um, but because I, I gave myself permission to like, think about it and explore it a little bit. Um, it was nice. And I gave myself the out. I find that an interesting situation because Ed, when you're talking about how, like, who is this person and and where is my spouse? I was like, but that is your spouse. That's that's exactly to me what I would want a partner to say to me. Like, hold up, why is this not possible? Is can you make it happen? Then make it happen. Like, like yeah. why not? Why not do for you what you want to do? Um, so it was like in that moment, I walked into the the hardware store and I didn't even know that I walked into the hardware store. Right. And what you needed was in the hardware store. Who knew it was, it was a really cool moment. Why does this um, hardware store have, have some bread? Oh my God. I, the, look, there's a fucking hammer in this hardware store. Isn't that weird? <laughs> so, um, I'm looking for so some I, bread, but oh, I found a hammer that I needed in order to fix the thing. Yeah. So, like, I think when, um, you know, like, also, like, with me losing weight, right? Like, so I need, um, I have a hiatal hernia, and um, I needed to... You know, the doctor was like, either, you know, uh, you know, they said, you need this hiatal hernia uh, surgery. Um, so we're also going to suggest a gastric uh, bypass. And I was like, no. Uh, and they were like, well, then you're going to have to lose like 50 pounds. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I'll lose 50 pounds. Um, but like, 
I needed to create my team. I needed to build my party um, because I needed I needed like the people around me who were going to support me. Um, and I didn't need people around me who were not going to support me and were going to, uh, you know, uh, not um, go on this journey with me. Um, so I made sure I had a doctor who is supportive of my needs. You know, my therapist was on board. Um, you know, I got a, I got a gym, um, and I did what I needed to do. Um, and I'm almost there. Um, cause I had a goal. I knew where I was headed. And I have goals. Yeah. But if, you know, to kind of go back to the, the question of like, you know, families or stuff like that, like if you are looking around at your party and you're recognizing that like, hey, there's a piece of this puzzle here that's not really fitting, right? Like they don't have to be there or they don't have to be part of your party, like your adventure party. They can be part of like your non-playable, your non-playable character party. Like the, like they don't have to have that much of an influence over your life. Or that random person that just is like you, you run into occasionally and maybe have a conversation. Yeah, but we keep the people close to us that are going to get us to where we need to go. Well, right, and I think like the 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 key point is like, are they a main like, are they part of the main cast or are they part of the supporting cast? Like to go yes. with this concept, because like I'm thinking in terms of what little I can relate to, in terms of like role playing and stuff, and like we were discussing earlier with D and D, it's like, oh well, so like the person that owns the local like establishment, like Jeff and I was saying about the tavern, they're a supporting cast member. And perhaps they like make connections or give you vital information, but you know, it's just Sam who owns Cheers. You know, like they're not your buddy, they're not your good friend. Do you know what I mean? Like there's someone that you're familiar with, but that's about as far as it goes. Um, you know, so therefore they end up in that kind of outer circle or other like framework as opposed to, you know, being a part of the the inner grouping. Yep. And the cool thing is you get to design that. <laughs> you get to create your world. I'm I'm laughing it's because I don't know how many times in the past, oh gosh, five years or more, I have said to people randomly in all sorts of conversations when they come to me and they're like expressing like anxiety, stress, concern, whatever about people in their lives. And I'm like, why are they in your life? And they just like they just kind of look at me and I'm like, I don't I don't understand if this person is causing you stress. Why are they in your life? Like, like and I'm not saying that that all the people in my life don't cause me stress. Don't misunderstand. I'm just saying I legitimately take very seriously the people that are involved in my life, especially those that I call friends, those that I call like um, family is something I kind of came up with years ago, which are friends that are family like it's your chosen family. These people I have like deep confidence in and, uh, you know, an abiding love with and I believe in and I'm highly supportive of. Have they been, you know, above board across all the time? No, they're human beings. And some of them have gone by the wayside because I just made decisions that I was like, I don't think we're in alignment anymore. But, you know, I I'm I've been kind of mystified in the past and now. I don't really try to dwell on it too much, but when I hear other people who are like going through these stressors about people in their lives that are causing them this grief or whatever, and I'm, I kind of try to politely reflect back to them and say, why? Why are you letting them do this? You, you are giving them capacity. You're giving them value. You're giving them power. Like you're giving them control. You don't have to do that. You can cut them out. You can say goodbye to them or you can limit them. You can put them in a box. You can be like, not now. Not today, Satan, you know, like you can just kind of check that stuff. Um, 
Yep. And I always relate it back to the analogy of social networks and stuff, especially when it came to Facebook. I was a little later to, to Facebook, not much than a lot of other people because I'm not a, I'm not an early adapter uh, or adopter. Like I'm just not a first gen person. I don't jump right in immediately and be like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Like it's just not me. So when I got onto Facebook, I took literally the title. So it says you like have Facebook friends, you friend them like you. And so I didn't accept friend requests from random people. I was like, I mean, consistently for many years, David and I have joked about it. It's like, bitch, I don't know you. Like, that's not how this works. And I still get them today, surprisingly. Just this past, like, two weeks, randomly people have popped up. They're, like, friend requesting me. I was like, I don't know you. And, yeah, like, and if I know you and I don't want to be friends with you, I don't delete the friend request. So here's a little secret. Like, the reason I don't delete the friend request is because most likely you're going to catch on or discover that you could re-request me, which is kind of the clue that I deleted it. And I'm like, I don't, I don't need you re-requesting. You could just sit over there. You can, you can be in the timeout penalty box or whatever you want to call it on there. Like, it's just not my, my thing. And, you know, and, and that's how I've felt insulated over the past couple of years, like, especially in the political realm and like people talking about like, you know, the stress and discovering things and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, why, why? Like I've hardly ever seen any of that. In fact, I've seen more of it since this most recent job, but that was because I made decisions about who I was connecting to in some ways. And then I started learning some stuff and I was like, oh, hmm, perhaps I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, and, I um you know, so I, you readjust. You're constantly, I guess, reevaluating. Yeah, so um uh so one of the other uh concepts that I uh I looked into was queer social capital. Um and to be honest, that's as far as I kind of went. <laughs> um but like so queer social capital and chosen families because we know that is a big thing in our community. Um, it's a huge thing in our community. And uh, I found this very interesting ar article that I have not read. I read the abstract, but it, it was the um, – it talks about the creation of a scale to assess – the um how people go about or what is important and the qualities of chosen families. I thought that was spectacular. Hmm. Um, so I, I'm really intrigued, Ed, because I think I think your your experience, each individual experience, dictates like your viewpoint. And also obviously impacts like your thought process, your feelings, your personality, how you act. And that can be really key because I can understand wanting to like have connection because that gives you value. Like we interpret that like it, psychologically internally. I feel like more often than not, we're like, do I feel of, do I have a purpose? Do I have value? Like, do I have worth? Um, I really think that's what all of humanity is seeking. Um, another way to phrase is that we're all looking for love, but love comes in many different forms. It can be physical, it can be spiritual, it can be, you know, emotional, psychological, social, blah, 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 blah. So, and, and my feeling on it is like, you know, that people have to determine these things. And even within our own community, we have to address that in some ways. And I see that at times because, so as an example, I recently went out with someone in another city. And they were like, you know, do you want to go out and grab dinner? And I was like, sure. And they're like, okay, what are you doing for? And I was like, oh, I don't really care. And they're like, how about this? And I was like, great, sounds good. So we go out to a, a queer owned establishment, which is checking a box. It makes me feel good because I'm being supportive of the community. And we go there and we go and we sit in one location and there's a band and it's kind of loud and we can't hear. So we move and we move to a different location, which is fine. And we sit and we order our food. We have drinks. The meal's good. The company's good. Um, and I'm a big people watcher, so I'm like paying attention to what's happening. And we're in more of an action kind of area, so there's people coming and going. And I see this little pocket of people 
And all of a sudden, I kind of realized that, like, this group is sort of a mystery to me as to why they're together. Like, I get that a couple of them are friends, but then I get that a couple of them are more acquaintances and are being introduced to the others and that, like, they don't quite have a Venn diagram in a way, like, that there isn't quite this crossover. And I'm sort of trying to figure out what it is. And then I catch that I'm <laughs> obviously staring. Um, because I kind of get a look from one of them who I think is kind of like, what the fuck's with this dude, like, staring at me or whatever. <laughs> and what I realized is, is, like, I was kind of unintentionally, you know, examining their social interactions and what was happening. But what occurred to me was, is that I was being a little judgmental because in my mind, I was like, they were younger. They were probably 22 to 25. And so my life experience said, was saying to me, like to the more primary individuals, I was like, babies, this moment, this thing, it's rather superficial. This is not going to matter in 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your life. This is but just an, a going out to the bar. And the thing that, that I was getting was this vibe and their energy and their look was like they wanted to be seen. So they had dressed a certain way. They were kind of acting a certain way, like carrying themselves. And I was like, oh. And I think it made me a little sad because I, I saw an echo of myself in my past. That I had a, a time where I wanted I wanted so much to be a part of a group that I was willing to do what whatever it was to be a part of that group. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of learned like, well, that's a, that was OK for that time in that place. But I also personally, I guess, matured or evolved or whatever you want to say, like, I guess I reevaluated and was kind of like, mm, these aren't these aren't like these are not people who are going to be here for me when things get bad, like when I come up against challenges, when I have traumatic events in my life and I need support to make it through the other side. So, you know, we just had National Coming Out Day. And I don't know if you read my story about, I didn't always know that I was a unicorn. Um, but uh, uh, the person that I came out to, um, I'm just amazed that I found him, um, that he was just placed in my path at the exact time when I needed him because he like, he brought me to a gay bar that was literally right down the street from my house. Um, and you know, he brought me there a couple of times and I had said that I'd made a couple of friends and everything. And he goes, no, no. You didn't make friends. You made acquaintances and you made, you know, people. They don't become your friends until you hang out with them outside of the bar. Now go make plans to hang out with them outside of the bar. Then they're your friends. And I was like, and I tell people that to this day, they are not your friends if the only place that you see them is in the bar. That's really interesting because I think the the takeaway for folks that are listening or watching is if you know of someone through like one conduit, like you have one theoretical connection with them, that does not necessarily make a friendship. It can, but it's a little bit limited because that's the only thing you have. And in the, what your example is that is that the way you do these people is because you went out to the bar. And I agree with you, like that was kind of the same thing because i look back on my life and i was like the people i used to go out with the bar i in fact i don't quite right at this very moment of the conversation really remember their names or who the hell they were i was just doing it but the people i have connections with the people that i remember are the core small group of people that i was friends with in high school the core group of people small group of people i was friends with in college and the friends that i met along the way post education that i now consider my chosen family like and then outside of that, there's many, many, many thousands, literally thousands of people through all sorts of different avenues, my occupation, past career, like social activities, groups, travel, whatever. I've met many, many, many people. But to yeah. know who the hell they are, not really. But like, I mean, if you think about it, 
I really, I, I really appreciate that wisdom because it was really a, a foreshadowing. Because what happened 15 years later? That one connection that I would have had with that person that I only hang out with at the bar, the bar's closed. So when you take that one connection that you have with that one person away, mm. you don't have a connection with them anymore. And this week, Facebook shuts down. Literally. That was an interesting experience recently for folks. Um, I was listening to another uh, YouTube podcast, actually, listening slash watching. And one of the hosts said about the change in technology, there are people in the entertainment industry. And they said when Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Messenger all went down, the problem they had for a couple hours was they were like, it impacted my literal career because – Instead of exchanging phone numbers, which we used to do, now we just DM, we just direct message. But because those systems were no longer operational, they couldn't DM. So they're like, I'm supposed to be going to a thing. Like, I have an obligation. I'm expected to be here, but I don't have a way to get in touch with the person that I'm supposed to be in touch with. Like they figured out they couldn't call them. And I thought it was a really prescient moment in that discussion to talk about the change of like societal norms and technology and all of this stuff. And the notably the two between the two hosts, there's an age difference. And the person who was older was saying they were completely in agreement. They're like, absolutely, which is why you should get phone numbers. But they were also talking about the hurdle that like in today's day and age, nobody really gives out a phone number anymore. Like they, you don't you don't give out your you know, your nine digits. Yeah. Because that's, that's now more than ever. That's private. Um, it's which is 10 digits, three, three, and four. All right. Five, 10. I was going to say 10 and then I was like, no, don't take, don't include the one. Anyway. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that's would, a, that would be 11. <laughs> right. But no, so I mean, your like your sequence of of whatever it is. I mean, if you're international, like your numbers may be different. But the point is, is like whatever your phone number is, it used to be the way everybody would be in touch with you. It was like your contact method, and we've really moved. I don't want to say a 180, but we've moved away from that. Like I'm thinking about that right now, Ed. I don't know if I have your phone number. Um, I have yours. That's nice. A lot of people have mine. Anyways, uh, that that was a fucked up humble brag. Uh, and that wasn't the point. The thing is, is, like, because of because of who I am and the things that I've done, I'm like, well, a lot of people have my phone number. But like in the reciprocal, I don't know how many people's phone numbers I actually have. Now I know I have Jeff's. Um, because of a certain incident that happened a couple of years ago, I would turn my. <laughs> yeah, that that, After that my was a key factor. Um, I mean, I'm sure if I needed to get your phone number, Ed, I could, because I'm pretty sure I have it in more than one way of connecting with you. I just don't mm -hmm. think I have you saved as a contact in my phone with an actual phone number. And that's an interesting aspect of, of the technology change, but it also speaks to how we've modified to today's current uh, day and age. So my point is, in bringing this up was, like, you know, how we how we are connected with people is really based on several different factors. I know I have contacts in my phone. Like I have, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have her still listed in my phone. I have a woman's first name only. And then afterwards in the last name field, I wrote pride event because I met her at Pittsburgh pride in the street, in the midst of the festival in a very like, high energy, exciting, loving movement. And it was like, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, so she was just exuding all this awesome energy. And she was like, we should hang out sometime here. Give me your phone. And she like, you know, put her first name in and put her phone number. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And she walked away and I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see her again. And I thought to myself, I need to remember who she is. So that's why I wrote Pride Event. <laughs> but she still exists on my phone. I've never talked to her a day in my life. I don't, I've never seen her again, but I haven't forgotten her just because of the circumstance of like how it all came together. So it is strange to me, like how we have these connections, but we like, how do we foster them? How do we maintain them? 
Mm -hmm. um, and where do we go from there? So uh, before I forget, uh, if those of you are interested in learning more about National Coming Out Day or NCOD, we did an episode last year in 2020, um, episode 573, where we talk about National Coming Out Day. So you can go check that out. But um, to kind of piggy off, piggyback off of the um, uh, the Facebook thing, um, it also shows um uh, i saw some uh i think on twitter or something that uh you know 70 percent of the world uh 70 percent of the digital world uses whatsapp mm. uh, because you know there's so much international uh converse uh and you know, like when I when I do talk to people who are, uh, you know, in other countries, they're like, "What's your WhatsApp?" Uh, and I had to get WhatsApp <laughs> in order to talk to people, and that's how a, a majority of the world communicates. So when that went down, it was like, "Oh, fuck!" Like there are a, a lot of um, like international schools there are a lot of like jobs that rely on whatsapp in order to communicate that just completely went dark for an entire day well i think what it the lesson i'm hoping everyone took out of that was that you need to have a backup system right so like like that's why a phone number is helpful because you can still text them theoretically or you know possibly call them or something um yeah because you know i mean when we were when i was working on actual covid investigation work that was one of the things that public health had to pivot to was they were trying to speak to people and call them and they and they didn't have a phone number but they had a whatsapp mm -hmm. and it was mostly younger individuals and in my brain i still didn't understand it i was like how can you have a whatsapp and not have a phone number because you technically have to have a device but anyways um and honestly, I still have an inter. I've never used that like platform because it's not relevant to me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a time and a place for that, but it, it really was, I think, a, a teachable moment for the world, I guess, like on the importance of reliability and monopoly <clears throat> and technology, and you know what you you have in those instances. Um, and like, like we were talking about before with social capital with Robert Putman, him saying that connections among individuals and social networks, um, and the norms of reciprocity, uh, that arise from them. Um, so like the norms are that like, yeah, uh, you know, we're going to use this platform or, you know, this is how we're going to communicate. And then when that goes belly up, well, what the, what the hell do we do? So like, I know that for me, I see it as you're part of my, like, you're, uh, you're more of an intimate person to me if I text you. Um, I know that you're more of a distal, you know, person if I'm communicating through you through Messenger. And that may be just in my head, um, but um, that's how I kind of code friendships. I think relationships of people i think that's fair i mean we probably all do it we just may not use the same mechanism so like i i message people i'm on messenger i'm on telegram and i like text or email i never really email anybody um <laughs> unless like i have something i need to send them but even then that's like can i reach it to them on another platform maybe i don't know so I, yeah i think it, it kind of is specific you know and if i had to call somebody to speak to them that's that inner circle thing like and that's where the two the two families come like kind of have that overlap if they're a blood relative i most likely have their phone number which is probably one of the few ways i do communicate with them and then if they're chosen family i have their phone number but i also have those other connections like in the the i guess the queer digital landscape mm-hmm yeah, so hmm. 
so this is a really interesting topic. Which part, the whole episode or just <laughs> the more recent discussion? <laughs> no, I mean, just the the whole episode and, you know, with, with the landscape of relationships, right? Like, it is very much like a literal landscape um, with networks and that, like, oftentimes we are at the center of that um, of that landscape. Um and we get to design it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, not always. Um, there are some instances where we don't have that much control. Uh, but for the, you know, the majority, and I would like to, in future episodes, talk about instances where we can say, you know what? This relationship isn't working for me. You're going to the background. Right. I, I think that that's a key thing that we may want to talk about, because I think there's different ways to handle it. Ghosting being one of them. Although some people have high opinions that they think ghosting is like a rude behavior or inappropriate or whatever. Um, but yeah, there, there are times in your life, I think, where people have to make decisions about relationships and say, I don't want this relationship anymore. And we're not talking necessarily about an intimate relationship, not a sexual one, not a romantic one. It could just simply be like a work relationship or like a friend, acquaintance. Um, or a family member. That too. Um, yeah. And you kind of have to make some decisions on that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, Good deal. Well, who are you traveling the light through life with? Versus those who you just encounter in a time to time. And yeah. It's building your party. Who who are you traveling through life with? Versus just encountering the barkeep, the shop owner, the leader that's of the really, town, the mayor. Yeah, that's really fair. Like, I've been... I still have this thing to this day after all these years, and I think it's just a, a cultural thing that I came up with. I was thinking about this recently, um, and I'm thinking more to you, Ed, in, in this moment is uh, we've had a lot of change at work, um, and especially in staffing. A bunch of people have left, um, and it's like causing some stress and, and stuff. And there's a key person that I interact with pretty regularly that I know is looking to leave. And very well by the end of the year may no longer be there. And it's it's disconcerting me because I feel like like I've just not understood all of my of my working life. I've just not understood people that just kind of like bing, 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 bing. Like they just kind of pop in and out. Like like having a job and switching to another job, no big deal. And I'm always like, what? Like I, I take a career, I take an occupation seriously. Like, and I try to do a thing that I have pride in. Like so it, it always has boggled me that people just kind of, I don't want to say blip in and out, but, you know, they just move on, pick a different thing. This isn't working or, you know, something about it isn't compatible for them and they just kind of move on. And I'm not saying that that they're wrong and that I'm right. I don't think that's it. It's just a different perspective on things. Um, and it makes me wonder why I find that so intriguing and sort of a little challenging to wrap my mind around because I think we just have different outlooks on, on stuff, but it also makes me wonder, like, do I choose to persevere despite circumstances because there's something about that, that has a payoff for me? I don't know. Just realized it was a little bit of personal therapy. I was putting out there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> But, yeah, I think there there's a, a lot to discern from that. So from the sounds of it in the future, one of our future episodes is going to probably be about, I don't know how to phrase it, like ending relationships or uh, changing their priority, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Um, I like came up with this. No, I didn't come up with it, but um, kind of like, a, like, are you familiar with the concept of proximal and distal? 
I've heard the words, but I'm going to say they're they're rather more academic, to be honest. Well, they're biologic in nature, but like, you know, like proximal meaning they're close to you and distal meaning they're farther away from you. Um, and in, you know, academia or like, you know, uh, different fields of study, there are like, you know, well, there are proximal factors and there are distal factors as to why something might happen, right? But I'm kind of wondering about um, this related to like building a party, right? Like, like proximal parties and distal parties, right? Like that, um, that's probably not the right language. Um, so I might need to do some more looking, but like, you know, knowing that like, okay, this person is part of my inner circle, right? Um, and th this other person is part of my third tier or whatever, and not like getting a third tier person confused with the first tier person. Kind of like what you were saying before about, well, why, you know, why are you so pressed by them? Why is mm -hmm. this bothering you so much? Right. Well, because I think uh, usually when that conversation has happened for me, as we get ready to wrap up the show here, I think when I've discussed this with people, it, to me, it's more reflective of the fact that I personally feel the other individual I'm speaking to has forgotten, lost track, um, perhaps been unaware that they always have the power, the ability to change it. Because I think when when they're when I'm interacting with them, I feel like they're coming to me with stress and anxiety, like this is being put upon them. And I want to be the person that says, but you don't have to put up with that. <laughs> like you you can you can change that. You can you could reprioritize them. You could be like, you know what? I don't like that part of you. So I'm gonna make you less important. Like maybe I'll move you from the inside to the outside or to a lesser, do you know what I mean? Like, like that, that's the part that, that is been interesting to me is to say to people like you, and especially when it comes to social media and like, you know, the, uh, the, the stuff that they post, that drives me crazy. And I'm like, why do you read it? Uh, you know, like, yeah, not to be rude to I'm them, but I was just like, <laughs> right. I'm like, uh, put them on snooze or oh, end that, the, that was key like, for me. <laughs> you know, and the and the interaction, the relationship, something I don't know. Um, that has seriously saved a couple familial relationships. Yeah, you know, I mean, for me, like I just found out literally in the past couple days, past week, someone who I've been acquaintances with for a very long time, we're no longer friends on Facebook, and I was surprised to see that. Now, to be fair, I haven't seen anything from them in a while, but I have so many people I'm connected to. The logarithm makes it really difficult to stay in touch with everybody. So mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised that I didn't see anything, but unfortunately, their partner passed away suddenly. And I was like shocked as a many as a, a great number of us were locally and we were like uh, 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 and i you know my concern really kind of heightened and i was like i well i wonder how they're doing and what's going on and that's when i found out i was like oh we're not connected and i realized that i wasn't the one that did that so i had to really kind of adjust myself for a moment and be like okay apparently they made a decision for us to not be connected anymore and to be fair, we don't we don't interact and we don't talk like we used to in quite a number of years. So that's their call. And I found out from a mutual friend that this other person did say to them. Because I passed a message through a mutual acquaintance and said, you know, hey, if you see them, let them know I'm thinking about them. And, you know, I'm you know, they're in my thoughts and condolences, you know, on the circumstances that they're facing and whatever. And so the message got back to me that they, you know, that they did deliver it and they thanked it. And the other person did say, yeah, we're not connected on social media anymore. Um, and they didn't really kind of elaborate anymore on that. So, you know, the, the, in the conduit, the messenger, so to speak, the mutual friend was like, you know, maybe you want to reach out to them. And I was like, I don't know. I said it the way I feel about it now is they made the decision for us to not be friends. I'm going to honor that. 
if they if they want us to be connected, I'm going to let them extend their hand because now is not the time. Like they're going through a whole pivotal life change and I don't need to be a piece of it unless they want me to be a part of it. Yeah, relationships are so impermanent. <laughs> right? Like and mm. they can be. Yeah. And I think that like I know that I struggle with this and have struggled with this and will struggle with this. Um is impermanence um i want things to last forever and when things change i freak the fuck out so perhaps that should be another thing that we talk about sure yeah yeah, yeah. How, how, did, how did how did you deal change with change relationship yeah, that's 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 good too. The yeah, we'll just make this like you know Edward's therapy hour. <laughs> <laughs> what all am I writing down just so I know? <laughs> the impermanence uh, of relationships. Yeah. Oh, that's that is a really good one. Despite right. and I got a really good, I got a relationship really, really, change, really, which means that all relationships aren't perfect. Yeah, I got a really good story for that one, too. Like, when you were a kid, you were really close to your mother, your father, both. But now that you're an adult, you're like, I'm so glad I'm down in Austin and they're way up there in Minnesota. And then later in life, you're like, I wish I was back in Minnesota so I was closer to my parents. Yeah. And there's this, like, yo-yo of where your relationship is with your parents. You know, um, like that. as an example, that may be part of another show. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, another final thought on building your party is it's going to change multiple times. Be prepared. Sometimes you have a barbarian, sorcerer, and cleric. Then next to you have a. Uh, a paladin warlock and uh druid yeah and sometimes you have control over that and sometimes you don't like my doctor just changed um i don't have a doctor anymore that wasn't my control hmm. that can be pretty jarring uh really really and i found a I, he was good really really good i've had a really hard time finding a um a doctor that meets my standards What's that's fair i'm very i'm very needy and pretentious <laughs> when with that i don't know about you but i think that's the end oh don't leave on that i don't want to ah. <laughs> in any case there's plenty of ways to contact us if you have more ideas about uh, landscape relationships or uh, want to respond to anything that we talked about. Who's in your party and what roles do they play? You don't necessarily have to say names. Just like my doctor or something like that. Um, you can comment on the blog to tell us that or shoot us an email. It comes out loud at gmail.com. Uh, the blog's at comes out loud at dot com, I should say. Uh, voicemail, you can leave us voicemail, sector otherwise, uh, at 361 we'll talk at 361-265-8255. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. Join our Entourage chat and chat us up at tinyworld.com slash telegram dash col. In fact, Ed is in our telegram. Uh, you you can also uh, find out when we're planning on recording these things. It's kind of weird for the next few weeks. Uh, uh, but uh, you can find that out all at tinyurlcom slash calendar dash col. You get various accoutrements, such as a Cubs Out Loud hat or uh, uh, consent is my four place shirt like Gary is wearing. He's got a sweatshirt, but you can also get a t-shirt or a long sleeve shirt or a tank top or just a sleeveless shirt because some people will say sleeves are bullshit. Thank you, Marisha Ray. 
Or you can get a, a the version one Cubs Out Loud shirt that I'm wearing, which I think is cute. And, uh, you can do all that at zettle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Also, some of our designs, such as the Consent is My Four Play shirt, uh, you can find, uh, was made by, designed by Smeshy. At, you can find more of his designs over at seekpublic.com slash user slash smashy the bear. You can also become a patron for us at patreon.com slash cubs out loud or just send us some money at paypal.me slash cubs out loud. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Audible. And you can find me anywhere on the internet as box, step box, puppy box, cub box, something or other. And soon, within the next week and a half, I think. Bears and Dragons will be returning on Thursday night, um, the 28th, I think I said, for Out of the Abyss. And you can find that on my Twitch channel at Windgem, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M. If you want to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as Gabriel73. Um, on Twitter specifically, uh, the one that we're going to talk about um, in the What's Going On episodes, where we sometimes talk about our not safe for work content uh my twitter handle is gamer 73 xxx edward uh if people want to get in touch with you there are several ways to do that uh if you want to get in contact with me you can find me on facebook at edward ac uh you can uh, uh, find me at my uh, business uh website at eactherapy.com um, I have a TikTok. It's Unicub79, and my Instagram is Unicub underscore Sex Brain Wizard. And if you want some uh, NSF or whatever, uh, I have a Twitter. Uh, it's Jeep Daddy Three. Just send me a message um, beforehand before I accept you to let me know who you are. I don't need my family or you know other people that don't need to see that on there and Thanks. that is completely understandable this is the reason why people have multiple twitters and with that um thank you night everybody good night everybody ciao for now <laughs>